Hello, welcome to this uh, eighth uh, robustly beneficial podcast, number eight. We will discuss the paper by uh, Lee, actually, today, uh, entitled uh, a Roadmap for Robust End-to-End -end Alignment. Yeah, uh, so this is a paper I started to write like a bit more than a year ago. And the reason for this paper is that um, um, well, I felt like in the alignment uh, research and AI safety research, uh, there was there, there were a lot of ideas, but there were like uh, local ideas and like mm -hmm. patches you can put here and there to solve this or that problem. And uh, I found it a bit frustrating that uh, there was not a global picture of everything that needs to be done. Uh, and I think this is very important in terms of safety because when you design, you're trying to design a, a safe. Um, algorithm or self, a safe process, then any part of this process is potentially a vulnerability. And if it was not designed carefully, uh, the whole system can be uh, compromised. So one of the key motivations of, of, of this uh, work is trying to uh, include everything, to have an end-to-end uh, alignment um, of the algorithm, like everything that needs to be done. So that was one of the, 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 the main motivation. And the other main motivation is to try to cut it down and to decompose it into uh, a huge number, if possible, well, not, not a huge number, but a large number of very small problems uh, that hopefully can be tackled uh, independently so that uh, anyone could just see, uh, oh yeah, this problem sounds interesting to me, I can work on this. And so that it's, its work on this is uh, extremely useful, even though the person who's trying to solve this part has no idea of what's done for the global picture. Mm -hmm. So yeah, that was the motivation of And so the decomposition you have is in, in five uh, main parts, and you would say that approximately every part has between five and ten uh, sub-problems that can be worked on? Uh, yeah, so that's uh, sort of how the, the paper is written. Um, it, like, I, I don't think like, any of this should be taken too rigidly, too, mm -hmm. too, too seriously. Like it's, uh, it's more like a, a, a picture to have in mind, uh, like a roadmap. Uh, you don't have to follow it exactly, but at least I think it's useful to have this in mind so that you know what are the, the different parts and also like what, it, what are the parts that are most neglected. Um, because some of these correspond to things that research that has that is already ongoing. Yes. Uh, but arguably, there are parts of it which uh, have not been uh, have been neglected uh, so far, and have uh, yeah, there is not enough research on. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So the the global idea of uh, of the the world map is something that's applied to algorithms that are maximization uh, maximizing something. So typically what I have in mind is mostly uh, reinforcement learning uh, in a very general sense. Like we have a, 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 like the last uh, video, the last podcast was about reinforcement learning. Uh, and we also saw that reinforcement learning is not that different from some like supervised learning on some longer time scales. Yes. And uh, like the roadmap definitely applies to supervised learning. It's, it's not specific to, to reinforcement learning. More generally, the problem is like if you have a, an algorithm that does maximization, and in machine learning these days we essentially only have al maximizing uh, algorithms, uh, then the problem of what this uh, algorithm maximizes becomes critical. And the whole point of the, the, the paper of alignment and especially robust end-to-end -end alignment is to make sure that what is optimized by our algorithms is something that we really should be optimized and that's going to, to, to benefit mankind by being maximized. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so this, what you are saying, sounds very much like the usual uh, way to, to discuss about the problem of the alignment. Yeah. So computing the, the right objective function for uh, knowing what, uh, what humans want to, truly want to optimize. Yeah. And uh, so, and actually, this is just one of the components in uh, in the roadmap you you propose, the center component. Yeah, I think we can use the names of the components. Yeah. So the the basic idea is to like I've tried to find a name to the different components that are easy to remember. But uh, like from my experience, they're not that easy to to remember mm -hmm. in the end. But it's like uh, Alice, Bob, Charlie, Dave, and Erin. So mm -hmm. A B C D E. 
So Alice, Bob, uh, Charlie, Dave, Erin. So Alice, Bob, and Charlie are like a very classical names uh, yes. in, in computing. So I did Dave and Erin, I guess. Um, and uh, they are all components uh, and doing something uh, to make sure that. So Alice is the main uh, is the maximization algorithm. It's the the thing that's uh, doing reinforcement learning or supervised learning. Like it's the the maximization algorithm. It's what most people are working on these days. Yeah, exactly. So, yeah, and what we want to make sure is that it's maximizing the right objective function. And the computation of the objective function, of the rewards to be given to, to Alice, is done by all the rest. Like, all the rest can be th thought of as uh, the reward system. Like, how to, something that computes the reward. Uh, and I think it's important to have in mind that in, in complex uh, applications, this, these rewards are going to be difficult to compute. It's not like a human can come and give the rewards, mm -hmm. uh, especially if you think of YouTube, like it has to give, receive rewards uh, like billions of times per day. Uh, so it, ha it has to be done algorithmically. And so the, the whole idea is to imagine that this algorithm that computes rewards, uh, it, yeah, there are different important parts of it. And so the different parts are Bob, uh, Charlie, uh, Dave, and Erin. So perhaps uh, confusingly, I don't know if I would do this uh, differently if I had to do this in now, but uh, it actually starts the other way. It starts from E, uh, from yeah. Erin, then to Dave, then to, uh, to Charlie, then to Bob, to then feed Alice with the right rewards. Um, and so the different components, so Erin is in charge of uh, data collection. Uh, it needs to get data in, Erin. <laughs> I don't know if it's uh, something to remember the name, but Erin uh, has to, to do data collection. If you think about this, uh, we can talk about uh, this again, but uh, if you think about this, like if you want to compute relevant rewards to be given to even to a kid today, like you need to know what the world is like uh, to know what is a good reward to be given. Uh, so data is critical. Uh, so that's Erin's job. Uh, but then you have to uh, realize that uh, data is usually partial, incomplete, biased. There's all sorts of problems with, uh, with data, even if you have very well, very good data collection. And so you need still to do some world model inference from the data. You cannot retrust the data. You need to do some world inference, world model inference. And this is Dave's job. So Dave's job is to try to represent the world, or at least all the relevant aspects of the world, uh, to give rewards. Uh, so, so that's Dave, Dave's job. And Dave is doing world model inference. And then he gives the state of the world to uh, Charlie, who, whose job is going to be computing how desirable the current state of the world is. So typically, if the current state of the world is great, then Charlie should say, uh, yeah, this is great, and should give higher rewards to, to Alice. Yeah, so that's why I was saying before that Charlie, in your roadmap, is the one doing the solving the problem of learning the values of humans. Yeah, yeah, and and then there's uh, Bob, which is uh, I think the most fascinating, the most uh, neglected, and the, the most important in the end uh, aspect of this uh, uh, of this roadmap. Uh, and uh, what Bob is going to do is to tweak, to is going to to modify the rewards given by Charlie to include uh, some uh, incentives uh, to, to Alice, uh, essentially to, uh, so that Alice takes care and even upgrades the, the whole reward system. Because um, you have to imagine that especially early implementations, but even later implementations of this reward system, of this uh, algorithm, are going to be imperfect. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a, a real risk of doing a counterproductive over-optimization of some measure uh, that's only an approximation of what we truly want to, to, to maximize. And there's actually a name for this. It's called Goodhart's Law. Uh, so Goodhart's Law is something uh, probably we'll be talking about this at some point also on this yeah. podcast. Uh, but I think it's something very, very important for, for alignment and safety. It's the, the observation made by uh, Charles Goodhart uh, who is an economist, that uh, once you optimize over something, uh, even though this something you, seemed very, seems very correlated with what you want to optimize, um, 
well, it can be very good uh, early on and it can seem to be very productive, but at some point, over-optimization can be uh, counterproductive, if not catastrophic. So the example uh, he had in, in mind was something about, uh, about uh, monetary uh, uh, transfers. Uh, you can think of, for instance, uh, GDP. Uh, so GDP is typically a measure of, uh, of how well, uh, it's, it's usually very correlated with how well people are, or the welfare of people. Mm -hmm. uh, so high GDP is, is strongly correlated with happier people. But, uh, and for a long time, as it was optimized, people were actually uh, getting happier, and life was getting better. But uh, arguably, uh, lately, uh, and maybe if you keep optimizing for GDP, it's going to have very uh, negative side effects. Uh, also, it leads to some, some politics or some, some, some strategies to, to sort, sort of hack essentially, essentially the measure. And this can be uh, counterproductive. Another example uh, that was given uh, of uh, good heart soul is uh, the fact that uh, school systems are, are now full of, uh, of, of rankings and scorings. Um, and this uh, incentivizes, for instance, uh, students to, to work for the exam and to, to yeah, train and, on. And later on forget because this is the he's just the low, lower, lowest effort solution to get a good grade. Yeah. 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 And if you think about what people uh, remember from uh, school, uh, it's a bit catastrophic if you think about this. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but, but it's also at a different level, like uh, uh, the Shanghai high hang ranking has completely changed a lot of the ways uh, universities uh, are structured. Mm -hmm. uh, in some countries uh, whose universities have a low ranking, uh, like, uh, like France, for instance, uh, they, this has led to a lot of mess. Uh, as you say, uh, when a, a French scholar is trying to give his affiliation, sometimes uh, <laughs> it changes from one year to another <laughs> every year because there's a lot of politics involved. and, uh, and Arguably, it's not that uh, clearly product productive for, for, for research or for uh, teaching in these universities. Okay, so somehow this is the, the role of uh, Bob yeah. in your roadmap, which is because the, the value learned by uh, Charlie will be never fully perfect, yeah. but uh, we can expect over time that they will better and better approximate our, our true values. Then to avoid that ALICE, which is the, the maximization algorithms, uh, over maximizes uh, the imperfect uh, objective function computed by Charlie. Yeah. Then Bob would uh, would uh, transform the the reward that Charlie computes and give to Alice a different reward. What else? Uh, you you mentioned that Bob is doing uh, is also giving other incentives to Alice. Yeah. yeah. So, so yeah, I think essentially is like making sure that Alice will take care of the reward system as a whole. Uh, making sure that uh, the data collected by uh, Erin are, are, are plentiful, but also reliable. Um, I think this is uh, a, a very important challenge for, for AI safety, uh, making sure that we have uh, reliable data, especially if you have large-scale uh, algorithms. So for instance, if you can ask, you ask yourself, uh, what is a good video recommendation these days? Uh, about coronavirus, uh, for instance, it's like uh, a very uh, mm -hmm. uh, present today. Uh, so uh, right, right now we are in the midst of, uh, of the coronavirus uh, outbreak. If you're looking <laughs> this uh, years in the future, maybe, maybe have you'll have forgotten. forgotten. <laughs> uh, but like right now it's, it's a bit of a big deal, like a lot of people are talking about this. And uh, it's not easy to know what recommendations should be given uh, in terms of the coronavirus. Uh, typically, you, you want to, people to, to be prepared for this, uh, but you don't want people to be, to, to be panicking. Mm -hmm. uh, and the level at which they should be worried about this has to do with how, risk, how risky it is for them. Uh, and it is actually very hard to know how, uh, like right now, for instance, at, at TPFL, uh, yeah, we, we've just had, I've just had this discussion, we regularly have these discussions with uh, different people. It's like, how seriously should we take this? Like, should we stop a public events? Uh, should we, is it okay to do this podcast, just you and me? I guess two people is, is fine. Uh, like, oh, yeah, what is the threshold? Uh, um, like, some people are just staying at home uh, out of safety. Um, 
and to better know what we should do and what we should not do. And because also this has strong economic uh, impacts, like the, the, the stock market uh, uh, plummeted because of, uh, of mm -hmm. like, uh, a lot of things are not happening because of, uh, of, uh, of prevention measures. Uh, so it also has a cost uh, to, to, to ask people to stay at home. Uh, and so what should be done is, is really a difficult question. And the, the, the key answer to what should be recommended typically by a YouTube algorithm uh, strongly depends on, uh, uh, on what the world is really like. Like if you could know uh, who is actually uh, uh, carrying the, the, the coronavirus, uh, it would be so much easier like, to, to, to give the right advice to, to different people. And to do this, you need quality data and having reliable data about the coronavirus is very difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, what's quite remarkable is that it's not completely impossible. Like we, like, so there's a, WHO has a, is doing a lot of, uh, or is trying to uh, organize a lot of the information about this. You have the Wikipedia page uh, on the, the coronavirus uh, outbreak uh, per country, uh, that lists uh, the number of cases per country. Uh, they try to have uh, more localized data and so on. So, I, and I think it's quite remarkable that we have access to, to, to so much data, uh, but th this is nowhere near uh, the best kind of data we could have. And so more generally, I think uh, to, 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 to give good recommendations to, to, to have uh, robustly beneficial algorithms, uh, data collection is really, really important and we should tr think about what, how to collect the best possible data mm -hmm. uh, to, to make algorithm beneficial. Yeah, so not only uh, airing the data collection uh, should be in the, in the pipeline yeah. of the end-to-end -end robust alignment, but also we expect that Alice, who has the possibility to influence the, the world, because she's yeah. the one uh, taking decisions, also should, uh, should make effort to to improve the quality of uh, the data collection process. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so one other thing I had in mind is that in, in this process is that essentially Alice would be the only one who's actually uh, uh, acting on the world in a sense, like sending messages in a uh, unboundedly uh, restricted manner. Uh, and as opposed to this, all the other components is, is just like. Uh, like again, I don't think this is like we should stick to what uh, I, I propose, uh, not at all. But uh, the idea I had in mind, at least, is like to make sure that Erin, Dave, uh, Charlie, and Bob were just doing their jobs and they were not like doing things that were not planned by this roadmap. Because if they were starting to, to send messages all over the way as well, then they would potentially be uh, causing harm that we did not anticip anticipate. Mm -hmm. So like the, the way of running is also like to, to restrict the, the, the risks the, of uh, like uh, dangerous uh, message propagation to just Alice. Um, but of course, um, this means that Erin cannot self-improve in a sense. Uh, and the, if, if it wants to self-improve, actually it should not want anything, but uh, if it wants to self-improve, like essentially it would be telling Alice uh, or Bob should be telling Alice uh, more, more mm -hmm. precisely that uh, that Alice should improve the, the whole uh, reward system, and this is done typically by giving to Alice higher rewards if the reward system gets improved, if, if there are better data collected in a more reliable manner. Yeah. So is it that uh, in the data collected by Erin, there is also data that describe how Erin is collecting data? Yeah. So so I think this would be the way to to see it. Uh, not only about this, I guess, but also uh, data about how uh, the whole reward system is functioning. Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, and uh, yeah, so that, that's a sort of the abstraction and collects data about the, the, the world, but also about the whole reward system and maybe even about Alice too. Okay, it makes me think again about the, the discussion we had on black boxes. Yeah. So sh should it be that also even if uh, Erin, Dave, Charlie, and Bob, they, they are collecting data about the world, completely aware of uh, the state of uh, Erin, Dave, Charlie, and Bob, should Alice be aware of that? Meaning that if, she is, uh, if, if the whole pipeline is fully transparent to Alice, somehow I expect that uh, she would be much better at uh, hacking it in a, in a way that are undesirable. So, so that, that would be uh, Bob's job to make sure that uh, 
like if there's a potential hack of the system, Bob need to, needs to give incentives to at least to, to patch it. So like, intuitively the idea is that Bob sees that there's some gap and immediately uh, Bob gives very bad rewards to Alice uh, because of this gap uh, in, the, in the reward system. And sort of with the promise or like the... So maybe um, there would be, maybe there would be ways to, to do this um, uh, because when, when I'm saying this, like it sounds hard to, uh, to, to make it like, computable with, uh, with rewards. Yeah, and I don't, also don't really understand when I when we talk about uh, this super intelligent system. If there is a gap, then we expect the the maximizing algorithms to to find it and receive high reward because of the gap. So, how does Bob affect? Oh, can Bob realize that there is a gap and uh, patch it? I, I I sort of understand that if Bob is able to patch the gap, then there is there is not a gap. There is not a gap. Uh, so, so, so if Bob detects a, a, a gap, it cannot fix it uh, directly. Mm -hmm. Like the, again, like because uh, yeah. I wanted uh, Alice to be the only one who's doing something. Mm -hmm. But what it, it can do uh, is to send uh, in promise higher rewards. And a way to do this, like typically that I have in mind, is to also send the, the gradient of the rewards compared to with respect to different things, well, in the world and in particular here in the reward system. So typically, uh, there would be a gradient of like if you slightly patch the the gap, then you know, I would give you high rewards because the gradient of it is high. So so that that could be a way to to to, to formalize this idea of uh, I saw this gap, you should fix it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So it, it, this really shows also that uh, Bob is needs to be in some sense better at predicting things than than Alice itself or something like this. Um, and, and yeah, uh, when I wrote this, like uh, uh, the first time, especially, I was like, I'm not even sure that there's a solution to this problem. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and it sounds extremely difficult, and, uh, and by no means like the roadmap solves uh, the problem. Not at all. Like it's just a way to decompose the problem, but it, it still seems like extremely hard, especially designing Bob. But uh, I grew slightly confident in at least the existence of a solution, <laughs> because. Uh, uh, the, the whole pipeline, and uh, especially Bob's job, uh, seems to me uh, very similar to uh, what uh, Julia Galef calls uh, intellectual honesty. So uh, there's a, a video uh, on YouTube, I put it in the description, where uh, Julia Galef uh, discusses uh, this concept, and she argues it's uh, extremely important, and uh, uh, I'm really convinced that, that uh, because like, typically if you uh, educate more scientifically, uh, the Democrat uh, people in, in the US, then they tend to believe more in the in climate change, which sounds good. But if you do the same to Republicans, then then they actually tend to believe less in climate change. Yeah. Um, and so this really shows that uh, scientific education is it maybe it's relevant, but it's definitely not sufficient at all, and can be even counterproductive in, in this case. And the reason for this, Jerry uh, Gelf argues, is that uh, maybe in this case in particular, uh, the Republicans uh, were lacking um, intellectual honesty. Like they got better at reaching their goal, at, uh, at arguing in their favor. And that's what a lot of what uh, scientific education teaches uh, in practice. Like maybe it's not what it should be teaching, but in mm -hmm. practice it's what it's teaching. Um, and she argues that uh, if you're more capable uh, to because of, of education, you're also more capable of lying to yourself, of, uh, of self-deception. And if you want to prevent that, uh, in a sense, you need to, to, to be striving for intellectual honesty. And intellectual honesty is making sure that the data you collected are actually unbiased and uh, you, you make sure that the data were reliable and, and things mm -hmm. like this. So that's Erin's job. You make sure that your world model inference from the, the data that you've read is done uh, in an unbiased manner and a good manner in a quality manner close to base rule if you're Bayesian. Uh, and, and that's Dave's job. And you also try to, to, to make sure that uh, whatever you're going to try to do afterwards, will be motivated by your true uh, volition and your true uh, preferences and not by uh, the thing you, you want right now because you're a bit tired and you just want uh, something uh, that you will regret uh, later on. Mm -hmm. 
And so in the end, intellectual honesty seems to be exactly uh, the problem that Bob is trying to solve, namely making sure that the whole reward system is performing well. And the way to solve intellectual honesty, uh, Joël Fargus, so there are essentially, well, there's only well, mostly one way, which is uh, giving yourself the right incentives. And uh, Joël Fargus, there are two kinds of incentives you can give yourself, uh, two kinds of rewards you give yourself. One of them is social, so you can surround yourself with the, the people who value intellectual honesty, typically, or things like this. And this, I think, hugely helps. Mm -hmm. But the other thing is internal rewards, is to make sure that you receive rewards whenever you access better data, if it, even if it's ba bad news, whenever you make better reasoning, more closer to base rule, even if it leads to conclusion you don't like. Uh, sorry, I had a bit of a problem during the recording. What I meant to say is that uh, you, if you want intellectual honesty, you also need to strive for the fact that you are acting according to your true preferences, your true volitions, uh, uh, things that you really, really prefer, and not things that you would regret uh, later on. So uh, I guess this is part uh, of uh, intellectual honesty. And to get there, you really need to make sure that all the components, Erin, Dave, and Charlie, are performing as uh, they are supposed to. Uh, and Dave's job is to give the right rewards to, in order to, to get there. Uh, and this really raises the question, like how can Bob make sure that the reward system is functioning well? How can he score the performance of the reward system? Uh, can he score, for instance, the performance of data collection by Erin? And I think this is a really critical uh, question. And the key for this is uh, certainly going to be uh, data certification, making sure that the data are certified as the, uh, they, they should be, uh, and in particular that uh, using cryptographic uh, signature, for instance, you can sort of guarantee the traceability of the data and making sure that the data comes from a trusted uh, authority. Yeah, so, so uh, the, the reason why uh, we, we trust uh, some text uh, is because it's signed. And I think the same thing must be more and more done for videos as well. Uh, like they, they should be uh, cryptographically signed. Uh, so I think uh, having a whole pipeline also of uh, certification and uh, signature for, from trusted entities mm -hmm. is really important. And if you think about uh, the data about coronavirus, uh, it's like mostly because it's signed that I trust what's on Wikipedia or, or WHO or the World Health o Organization. But uh, the problem of uh, data collection is much har harder than this. Uh, you have all sorts of biases and stuff like this. Um, somehow we humans are st somewhat able to, to judge how biased things are. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yeah, I think we need to reflect on how we do, do this and to, to make sure that algorithms are, are doing this well as well. Um, and then there's uh, the, the other parts of the pipelines. Uh, for instance, um, uh, Dave, uh, who's doing world model inference. Um, like you need to be able to assess like how, how good it is at, at doing this. Uh, like one way we do this, at least for, for humans, is to give them uh, test or to like to track to ask them to explain how they switch their minds I, I think like th this is also a problem that is posed for humans like mm -hmm. uh, how do you make sure that a, a given individual has a good role model especially for controversial topics uh, this becomes very important and, and tricky so you like, mean when you you humans agree on the data that they have they have observed yeah but still don't agree on uh, what they infer about the world yeah then uh, how they will uh, discuss with it, with one another too yeah. Yeah, and uh, if you are an external uh, observer, and you 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 see how they make their inferences, yeah, how do you determine which one is doing the best inference? Yeah, yeah, I think this is a, a difficult problem. So there's one uh, trivial answer, I guess, is like just do all the computations that they were doing or apply based rule to everything. But uh, that would not be like desirable to, for Bob to do this because essentially he would have to do the whole pipeline uh, itself mm -hmm. and then he would itself become a liability and, and stuff like this. So uh, I think it's important to have algorithms that are able to assess if other algorithms are doing a good world model inference. Um, and uh, for some cases, I, 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 like, there, there are some people that we maybe tend to trust because we see them changing their minds, explaining themselves, uh, um, have uh, yeah, like displaying intellectual honesty typically. Um, so these are always to, to, to gain trust in, in a world model inference. 
that are not by redoing all the computation of, uh, of the world model. So, so you think that the, the research in uh, machine learning about uh, interpretability fits in this? Uh, in yeah, this I think in the end, interpretability uh, is going to be uh, important. I think it's even more crucial for, for, for Charlie. So Charlie is trying to infer like uh, human preferences and uh, even maybe uh, even uh, human volitions. Um, so imagine you have in front of you an algorithm. So Charlie and uh, and Alice is telling you uh, trust Charlie. It has your preferences. Uh, well, you probably shouldn't trust it blindly. Yeah. Uh, and uh, probably what you're going to try to do is to interact with it. And uh, so there's a really nice paper about this uh, called the We Build AI. Uh, at some point, probably we're going to talk about this, uh, where you have this interpretability that's uh, really uh, critical to gain trust in in the system. But this works well for, for preferences. Uh, it's uh, already a bit harder for uh, so-called uh, social choice. So social choice is like, okay, it, the, the algorithm has taken into account what I prefer, but um, does it affect its actual uh, decisions? Because its decisions should be affected by what everyone prefers. So it has to aggregate the different preferences. Um, and here you have the sort of the same problem of, as a, uh, making sure that your vote has been taken into account in a presidential ele election, for instance. Mm -hmm. um, if you really think about it, it's not easy to verify. Like, uh, in the end, you sort of trust that there's people who are doing their jobs and checking on one another, but you don't know any of them. Uh, yeah. um, and in some countries, it, it can be a, a big of a problem. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm not naming any country, but <laughs> uh, yeah. Uh, so, and, and these are, are still relatively easy compared to uh, the interpretability of an algorithm that's computing your volition. Because you don't even know your volition that well, probably. And maybe the algorithm is going to conclude that if you thought longer, you would actually prefer this. But right now, you don't actually prefer this. Uh, yeah. It's like talking to your, like, uh, your, your, your parents, and the parents supposedly know you, know, know you better, and maybe they do. But they still need to convince you that they know you better. Mm -hmm. And that can be very, very hard. So like here, interpretability is key and it's going to be very, very difficult because you need to convince uh, humans uh, of things that maybe they don't want to believe in. Uh, and, and that can be very, very uh, tricky. It's another part of the, the challenges. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I 100% agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that, that's the overall uh, picture. So, uh, um, maybe instead of, uh, so, so maybe in this case, like uh, instead of uh, trusting the result of the computation or redoing the computation yourself, you, you, you can rather try to gain trust in the algorithm itself, in the, what are the, 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 the key steps of the algorithm that computed your volition. And if you're convinced that, yeah, like uh, sometimes if I explain to you that the algorithm, uh, to your, your, your inputs, your preferences, but it's so that people who has your preferences, uh, if they thought longer, ch ch change their minds. So it, it actually observes people who thought longer mm -hmm. and actually change the, uh, their minds. And that's why it anticipate, anticipated that you would change your mind as well. Maybe it starts to be a bit convincing that uh, the algorithm is actually doing the right prediction, um, especially if it gives like examples of people you know or something like this. Yeah, okay, but this sounds like uh, changes over uh, a short, pe short period of time. Yeah. And also, uh, I expect a lot of uh, mind changes are not only in that category where maybe everyone would be changing their mind uh, at the same time. So maybe uh, if we uh, today compared to three months ago, I think a lot of people have changed their mind about how important it is to, to be prepared against pandemics. Yeah. And... Uh, so if three months ago the algorithm was, was telling us uh, you would all prefer that the world was more prepared against pandemic when the people were not very worried about it at all. Um, so yeah, in that case, I, I, there, there is not really any example of, uh, of people that pre previously changed their mind and everyone has changed at the same time. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah and, and, and sometimes it's easy, like, if you take the example of uh, uh, well-educated uh, Republicans who deny uh, mm -hmm. climate change, um, 
it's going to be very hard to change uh, their minds. Uh, even if you do the YouTube algorithm, uh, well, for, for me, it's like impossible to change a Republican's mind, uh, like that at least. But maybe the YouTube algorithm can have a repeated exposure, but it still needs to do, do this very, very well. And, um, and in the process, like there's always the risk uh, that the, the, the user stops trusting the algorithm. And they says, yeah, I don't want to, uh, like, I think this algorithm is just trying to manipulate me into changing me uh, into something I'm not. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, this just shows, like, <laughs> how, how difficult the problem is. Um, and it, it has to do with uh, a lot of the, in, in this case in particular, with the interface between uh, uh, algorithms and humans. And uh, we already talked a lot about this, about psychology. I think psychology is, is critical for... For, for, for designing robustly uh, beneficial algorithms, uh, just to see the impacts of the algorithms on humans, but maybe also like to draw inspiration from some humans that are particularly good at intellectual honesty or whatever, yeah. to try to to design these uh, algorithms and especially uh, Bob. <laughs> yeah, and I see also that psychology is uh, very relevant for for learning human preferences. Yeah. If you we had this discussion about uh, a previous paper on uh, preference learning where if we don't know how irrational are the agent we are observing, then it's, it's extremely hard to, to know what are their, their true preferences. Yeah. Because um, irrationality would be when you have a behavior that does not show your true preferences. A um, common example I'd like to, to mention is the example of uh, Kasparov playing chess. And he plays imperfectly. Uh, a, a perfect chess engine would know that Kasparov does not want to win because he, he always plays the wrong moves. And, uh, but this is quite stupid. Yeah? If, we, if you know the human psychology and you know that Kasparov is trying his best to, 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 to find the, the right moves to play and uh, anyone could, could know this and it's quite obvious. Yeah, well, I would guess that the algorithm still guesses that uh, even though he's not trying to win for sure, he's still like trying to uh, not lose. <laughs> yeah, maybe not, not anymore. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, that's clearly a, a prime like for... Uh, for all the primes on um, uh, more controversial or more complicated like, uh, I don't know, like social justice or like to, or like climate change and stuff like this, like sometimes people uh, advocate for ideas that are not that clearly uh, productive for their own uh, goals. And so an algorithm that learns it, uh, like tries to do uh, inverse reinforcement learning on this, uh, may not conclude uh, the well, may conclude that the human has different preferences than uh, mm -hmm. its actual preferences. Uh, so yeah, that's uh, one additional uh, challenge. <laughs> yeah. I, I guess uh, one last uh, uh, challenge, uh, which is the, 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 uh, the last section uh, before the conclusion of the paper, is about the need for uh, distributed algorithms. Um, so, like, as I presented uh, the, the roadmap, uh, especially for pedagogical reasons. You would have only one Erin, one uh, Dave, one Charlie, one Bob, and one Alice. So I think it's easier to, to think if you only had this. But in practice, uh, it's very dangerous to have only one of each because each one is a single point of failure. Mm -hmm. uh, if uh, suddenly Dave stops working, uh, then the rewards cannot be computed based on a model of the world. Uh, and so the, the, the rewards can be completely unaligned uh, yeah. suddenly. And uh, yeah, the, the algorithm could be uh, dangerous uh, because of this. Uh, and so you want to make sure that every component, especially of the reward system, is at least duplicated and, uh, and that all of this works well. Uh, it's even hopefully uh, resilient to attacks because you can have to imagine that there's going to be malicious uh, people uh, in the inter the internet is full of them <laughs> and uh, so you, you have to make sure that each of the components is designed as a decentralized uh, so-called Byzantine resilient uh, system which means that uh, it's uh, going to be actually a network and even if parts of the network uh, crash or get hacked or or get blocked, uh, then the whole system as a whole like, is still going to perform uh, at least roughly as we want it to be performing. 
and that's the, the whole problem of decentralized uh, machine learning. Uh, yeah, which is an additional problem. Um, yeah, so the, the topic we often talk about uh, robustness, it mm -hmm. applies to each of the, of yeah. the component of the, of the system. Yeah. Yeah, also like robust statistics is critical at every step along the way. Uh, yeah, like robustness is going to be critical and it's not easy. Yeah, yeah because we expect that the, there will be adversaries in the world and so the, the data collection could be uh, poisoned. So even though we are trying to increase and do a good, uh, good quality uh, data collection, there might still be uh, some uh, poison data coming in. So the, the job of Dave would be that to still be able to compute correct uh, world model even though uh, Erin has not provided the the very clean data yeah and etc yeah we talked about this about the coronavirus i guess uh, there are not uh, hopefully uh, too many malicious users who are trying to hack uh, the different uh, trustworthy uh, systems uh, so that uh, misinformation spreads among the big platforms but you can imagine like for instance uh, uh, on the Wikipedia page uh, about the coronavirus outbreak. So I, I, I haven't looked really at the figures, but I, I think it, may, maybe there were like a hundred. Uh, uh, so from what I remember, there were like 10 in individuals, 10 contributors who were responsible for 40% mm -hmm. of the page. And I, uh, I'm guessing like uh, uh, yeah, 100, maybe 200 people uh, max are responsible for 90% or 95% of the page. Um, so, that's quite distributed, I guess. It's not like one individual, and that's better. But it's not that many either. And you can imagine that someone who's really want, who really wants to spread uh, misinformation. So maybe the, the coronavirus is uh, not something like people want to uh, are sufficiently motivated to to put misinformation in. But if you can imagine uh, the page on, on Google or the page on, on Donald Trump or like something that are very controversial, like mm -hmm. these pages are going to try to be uh, there are incentives to hack these pages. And if there are a hundred people and it's like really, really uh, like people are really motivated, then people people might like the, the bad malicious users might eventually use uh, uh, some illegal uh, things like uh, blackmailing or, or, or threatening. To, to get a modification of, of, uh, of Wikipedia, especially if the profile of the Wikipedia contributors are unknown. And this would, be, uh, well, this would allow them to hack the, 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 the critical, the, the most reliable information that many people rely yeah. on. So you're saying that uh, if it's only 100 or 200 agents, it's, uh, it's, you, you would consider that not, not yet robust? So, so, so I think it's quite robust. Uh, so the problem, if you have more people, then within the Wikipedia community, there can be uh, already malicious people trying to... So you don't want to grow too, too big, uh, yeah. but, it, but you don't want to be too small. Uh, so I guess the, 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 more, the more you accept contributors, the more uh, you are vulnerable to malicious users among the contributors. But the smaller you are, the more single points of, uh, the more every individual is a single point of failure. So there's, there's a trade-off. I think Wikipedia is, uh, is, is performing very well, uh, especially these days. Uh, but it's not that much of a given that it will always perform as, uh, as well as it is. Um, I, I, so I would still like uh, predict that it's still going to be uh, quite fine. Mm -hmm. Uh, but if you leave, like, maybe if there are increased tensions all throughout the world, uh, maybe the, the internet can be, become even more adversarial, like more and more people are pushing for their own ideas. And in this case, uh, well, I hope Wikipedia will never fall, uh, of, of course. Uh, like it's arguably the most reliable source of information we have uh, these days uh, uh, in the world. Uh, and, and I hope they, they will. Uh, Still quite believe that they will be uh, resilient to this, but it's something to, to ponder. I think, uh, like, b especially if you think before the advent of uh, Wikipedia, uh, yeah, it wasn't a given that there would be Wikipedia. It's, it's same thing for the, uh, the World Health Organization. Like, at some point, like, some people actually wanted to create the World Health Organization because they were scared of what well, they wanted to have better uh, global health and also like to. To, to fight a potential uh, pandemics, but it was not a given. Like you, you had to have people who were motivated to do this, and 
like I've heard like uh, like uh, from back channels like because WHO is not that far from us like it's in Geneva uh, but I, I've heard that uh, like financially they were not doing that well uh, last year like I'm, I'm guessing they're going to be doing better this year uh, because of the coronavirus but uh, yeah the, the resilience of such structures is also uh, important and uh, something to, 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 to think about uh, yeah, yeah. so you think that uh we could get inspired on how Wikipedia get humans to collaborate together. Even though humans, uh, I, I guess the one that participate on Wikipedia, they still disagree on a, on a lot of issues. Yeah. Yet the product that is aggregated from them is somehow very reliable, neutral, and uh, doesn't have a, is not full of fake data. Yeah. So we could get inspired on how Wikipedia stays uh, quite robust to all these adversary that try to manipulate the platform but still get a good result. We could do the similar things when considering uh, each of the components of the, of the roadmap. Yeah, I think it's something to draw mm -hmm. inspiration from. All right, so yeah, one case would be a, a distributed uh, DAV that so many, many agents, many servers, all trying to infer world model from the data collected by Erin, but maybe not, not each individual piece get to see the whole data. They, get to, they, they, they see only part of the data. So they, they would compute slightly or very different world models, but then they would still need to, we would still need to ag aggregate these world models to, be, to decide what to share with, uh, with Charlie. Yeah, so that's actually a, a paper I'm currently <laughs> working on, <laughs> uh, trying to do uh, uh, decentralized uh, learning in the presence of uh, malicious users, uh, malicious uh, nodes, like uh, people who can uh, uh, participate uh, adversarially to, to the system. Um, yeah, like the, it's a, it's a difficult uh, challenge. Uh, the the remarkable thing that is is the well, the blockchain. Um, like uh, the blockchain has, uh, especially Bitcoin, has allowed like this uh, uh, remarkably resilient uh, system. So if you think about Bitcoin, like it, it's never been off for the last uh, 12 years. Uh, and uh, it's quite unique in its uh, in, in its, uh, in, its in, in its genre, um, and uh, I think that there are inspiration to be drawn for this from this. But uh, on the other hand, like the Bitcoin has a lot of flaws. Uh, the Bitcoin is like extreme polluting; it's not that fast, and stuff like this. Uh, and there's still a lot of research to be to be done. Um, lots of improvements, so, uh, for instance. Uh, like there's a professor, Rashid Garawi, who's working here, who worked on something called 82, uh, where you, you, you could do a lot of the blockchain. But I, I think uh, there, there are ideas, and I'm actually work, currently working on this, about trying to, to do these things also for, for machine learning algorithms, mm -hmm. um, trying to design them uh, in a robust manner, but uh, still, uh, you also still want uh, performance uh, out of this, um, uh, because like, Nobody is going to implement something that's uh, extremely costly, uh, energetically, and extremely polluting, and stuff like this. So, and, and that's a, a big challenge as well. Okay. Cool. So, uh, yeah. So, uh, uh, like, yeah, I, I, yeah. So, so, yeah. After, so it's been a bit more than a year than I first thought about these ideas. I think they are. I'm happy to say that I still think that they are not completely useless. <laughs> Uh, it's, it's always like trying to see how these uh, ideas uh, grow old, but uh, I, I think they are useful. So, <laughs> uh, yeah. has there been a similar work, but taking another direction, uh, as what you try to what what you have done? So, I, I don't know about any alternatives. Uh, I, I think the ideas are, are quite uh, reasonable and and sensible mm -hmm. and uh, natural solutions as well. Like. Uh, um, so, yeah, I hope I hope this can help people better think about the problem of alignment, and also to real, to realize that uh, it's very difficult. Um, I think this is a, kind of a theme of this uh, podcast, but uh, uh, AI safety is not easy. It's really really not easy. Uh, there are lots of potential potential pitfalls and uh, and risks. And the, the technical challenges are extremely hard, and you need a, a lot of brilliant people working on it. Um, and also, what I, I tried to do uh, in this paper um, was also like to, to, to show that there were interesting problems, like there were problems 
that I think are interesting for their own sakes. Uh, so like like the work I'm doing these days on, on uh, distributed uh, Byzantine learning is also like mathematically quite, quite really, really nice. Like, uh, uh, like um, I haven't done a, such beautiful mathematics for a long time. I was very just happy to do this. Uh, um, and I think there are lots of problems like this uh, in the roadmap. If you think about this, uh, well, there are ways to pose them as really nice problems. And I, I hope also we're doing this in the podcast, like every episode we're trying to, to suggest research ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and yeah, hopefully this can inspire people and to, to tackle some of these ideas. <laughs> Very great. Good. So I hope you've enjoyed uh, this, uh, this podcast and I uh, hope we'll see you uh, next time. Yeah. Bye.